a universe of data to sharpen our view of the most distant galaxies. And studying black holes to help prove Einstein's theory of gravitational waves. I am a healer, giving doctors the power to turn mountains of data into life-saving breakthroughs. Identifying diseases like leukemia from a simple drop of blood even in our own homes, and finding new ways to bring cures to market faster. I am a protector, keeping our oceans safe from invasive species, and helping our crops flourish while minimizing pesticides. I am a helper, assisting customers in stores, and the disabled in their homes. I am a navigator, mapping our world one millimeter at a time, and making even the largest self-driving vehicles safer for the long haul. I am a creator, learning to paint from the masters, and applying their styles to create original works of art. I am a teacher, analyzing half a million player moves every game to identify strengths and weaknesses, and a learner, discovering new strategies from complex games. I am even the composer of the music you're hearing. I am AI, brought to life by NVIDIA, deep learning, and brilliant minds everywhere. The internet and e-commerce has affected every person in this room over the last 15 years. Looking at the video, we're actually living through what is now an inflection point, and many people tip it to be the fourth industrial revolution. Our generation of doing business and looking around, it may not apply to everybody, but there was this thing called a filofax <laughs> that transformed into a fax machine, to the post-PC era, to smartphones, and now we're at the cusp of machine learning and AI. The next stage of the revolution predicts 50 billion connected devices to a current of 8 billion. These devices come in the form of fitness devices, Teslas, cameras on drones, patrolling warehouses, sensors on the road that predict footfall into shopping, shopping centers in the form of IoT. The internet has evolved to the world's nervous system and there is a universe of data that's being created daily. Connected devices lead to faster and more complex decision requirements. In the next wave of this information revolution, technologies such as machine learning, machines thinking for themselves in the form of artificial intelligence, 3D printing, robotics, all require a major shift in thinking in terms of its effect to the human workforce. With the advancements of semiconductors and the parallel processing of data, Machines in the form of AI 
will start to be able to predict mass calculations in the future of maybe one second ahead of an event happening. With more processing happening, that one could become two to become five. All the companies that you saw in that video are classed as exponential organizations. They've embraced technology. The new revolution is going to create opportunities, threats, and pose some challenges that's not been faced by businesses. AI as a whole has been sensationalized. You've got some very vocal people, uh, the likes of Elon Musk, the late Professor Hawkins, Bill Gates, all questioning AI and where machines will go. God created man, man discovers science, man and science creates machines. Machines think faster than man, so the question now is where machines and science will lead to. And that's one of the most interesting debates about where technology is going. And taking that sensationalist view and bringing it right down to today, what exists, what influences do we have, is why we're here. There's four ingredients which I see as absolutely vital for this next stage. We've talked about data, and data is growing at this exponential rate. And it's what we do with that data. It's about regulation, then comes into account infrastructure, about the cloud, on-premise data sovereignty and ownership. Bolted onto that are skill sets in the form of data scientists, data law, security. And encapsulating all of these points is exponential processing. The rise of the GPU in terms of parallel processing, the CPU's been around for many years, but it's this exponential processing that's now hitting the market that's allowing data to be processed at the rate at which it's being developed. Some of these high-level ideologies are here today. And at MSP, we've brought in an ecosystem of some of the most sought-after companies from Silicon Valley here today to actually make available and demonstrate some of the technology that's available. We're honored to have uh, James McClung here from NVIDIA, who's a world leader. Uh, NVIDIA's a world leader in GPU technology. We have H2O who is uh, an, um, a world leader in uh, AI analytical software. Kinetica, a world leader in GPU accelerated in memory databases. And pure storage, the same for infrastructure. The whole idea is to package all of this here today and allow you opportunities to talk to people through a mechanism called the Deep Learning Institute, which is something that James will talk about, which is a, a funded activity from NVIDIA. The idea is that it brings a, a set of training skill sets from novice to expert in different industry fields, all focused around understanding deep learning and AI. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, James McClung from the team. Thank you very much. So NVIDIA founded in 93, uh, we're pioneers of discrete GPUs. The reason why we wanted to make a discrete GPU, um, a graphical processing unit, um, is because of this. So we realized, um, I won't play this for very long in case people get triggered. So we realized that one of the biggest factors in the quality of a computer game was the quality of its graphics. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the CPUs back in those days weren't really up to the task. So I'll turn this off. No, great, okay. The CPU has an awful lot of things to do whilst it's playing games. It needs to run off, look after your operating system, it needs to look after your mouse and keyboard, it needs to keep an awful lot of lights on, and, and the high quality graphics poses a unique mathematical problem. Um, you see, graphics require fairly simple mathematics, just delivered continuously, all at the same time, in a stream without any kind of pause. And unfortunately, that's not really a kind of model that sits particularly well when your computer's trying to do an awful lot of other things. Um, so we thought we would create a separate, unique piece of hardware that would carry this workload, um, and everyone thought this was a terrible idea. This is nuts. People don't want two processors in the computer, of course. Um, but that was back in 93. So we, uh, we, we pioneered um, GPU technology along with a, a couple of other companies. Um, and this is what it looks like today. This is the GPU given its modern form. This is an enterprise GPU. Uh, but anyone who plays games um, will be familiar with, with pretty much what we're looking at here. So 
What this does is it's designed to take lots of very simple mathematics and process them all in a stream, all at the same time, without any kind of pause, and offload that work from the central processing unit. And this is how it works. So it's a coprocessor. Your CPU is optimized for serial tasks, and the GPU is optimized for parallel tasks. Um, and graphics was the first application of this particular problem. Um, however, uh, we realized about 11 years ago that there were a number of other scientific problems um, that followed the same workload. Uh, lots of simple mathematics delivered all at the same time without pause. And this is how it looks. Simply, you take parts of the code um, that are parallel and you offload them to the GPU. And, and this has worked quite successfully. As I say, for the last 11 years, we've been uh, taking um, problems with a similar workload putting them across over to the GPU and, uh, uh, and performance or uh, power saving is achieved because of that. And as I say, this has been going on for a while now. We've got some pedigree in doing this. Um, the Nobel Prize for Physics 2017 gravitational waves, the parallel part of that code was run on the GPU. Um, Nobel Prize for Chemistry in cryo microscopy. Um, this, is, this is a breakthrough um, scientific field that you probably haven't heard of because we keep talking about artificial intelligence. Um, but the code um, is exclusively run on NVIDIA GPUs here. Um, and of course, computational chemistry, pretty much the entire field of molecular dynamics at the moment is run on NVIDIA's GPU because they all have the same mathematical properties, fairly simple mathematics, added together, um, run through it, uh, uh, at a high rate. However, we're not here to talk about this. We're here to talk about um, perhaps the most famous example of uh, a workload with this type of property, um, which is the convolutional neural network, the artificial neural network. Um, and as you can see, I don't know if, uh, if anyone um, uh, remembers their algebra classes, um, this is pretty much all it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a workload that sits incredibly nicely on the GPU, and so this is why the world's basically picked up GPU computing um, uh, for, for use in artificial intelligence. So we're going to focus on this deep learning. So they're not new. We've been talking about neural networks now since at least the 60s, some say the 20s. And as you say, if you look at it, it's, it's actually disappointingly simple. Um, so really, uh, I don't know if there's laser pointer works. No, we don't have the luxury of that. So really, all it is is that equals that and that, that and that, that and that, um, add a function. So the weight of the neural um, is that. It's really simple stuff. So the weight of the neuron, if we had like a, a red fire engine, we would expect to see a red neuron um, uh, get a stronger weight. Um, but it's just simple mathematics, just delivered at very high frequency, all at the same time, um, without any kind of pause. It sits very nicely on a GPU. Um, and um, what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about why this is something fairly new. So. As I say, we've, we've known about neural networks for a while now. Um, the reason why we weren't excited about them a number of years ago is because you know, basically they were rubbish. They, they didn't work very well. Um, they were considered a bit of a toy. And I'll use this graph here, which isn't an accurate scientific graph, but it's just a, a way of representing uh, the reason why this is a technology which has become interesting today. So this is basically a representation of all machine learning problems. Um, you'll, see, um, uh, you'll see a relation between the amount of data that you put into your machine learning problem. Um, sooner or later, the network saturates, and you, uh, you end up getting decreasing performance. Um, and so one of the ways that you remedy this is you, you hand code in uh, feature extraction to your machine learning algorithm. And this is the way it's been done since the 80s, really. Um, if you think of all of the bad guys in your computer games, all using this kind of stuff. If you think of um, your, your AOL um, spam filter, it, it's all working on this kind of stuff. It breaks, and you have to hand code specific features to be extracted. And you can get some incremental performance gains in there. Um, hand coding the difference between a dog uh, and a cat is, is quite complicated, um, but it's doable. Hand coding in differences in tumors, for example, if you're looking at medical images, is far more complicated. You end up having to have two consultants in the, in the room at that point. And so our humble neural network, massively underperforming, 
Um, it was considered a toy, so in computing science classes, it would be uh, something you'd spend half a day on to say, look at this kind of interesting technology, but let's not spend any more time on this. And, and research um, at the turn of the century into support vector machines, um, which is a really interesting form of machine learning, uh, killed research into neural networks stone dead for a generation. Anyway. We only just figured out the reason why. So this is the kind of data set that people were using um, from 2000 up until sort of 2010. Um, so this is the famous MNIST uh, training data set. It's considered a toy data set these days. Um, it's something that you can stick on any pen drive. Um, it's a load of handwritten images, 60,000 training images, 10,000 testing images, um, and with this you build a neural network that will tell um, uh, handwritten digits with a certain degree of accuracy. Um, and this was a state-of-the-art data set at the time. Um, now, nowadays, it's not really considered anything more than a toy. As I say, you can, you, you know, you can send this data set across over Wi-Fi. Um, you can send it across over Bluetooth. It's fairly small. All the way up until 2012. Now, in 2012, um, the breakthrough happened. So. There's a competition every year called the Large Scale Image Recognition Challenge, um, and this is the kind of UEFA Cup of academics where uh, they put together um, a, a network, a machine learning network, in order to identify um, images, um, classes, and categories in um, the uh, uh, ImageNet data set, which is about one and a half million images containing about 1,000 different categories, so dog, cat, ball, those kinds of things. And everybody's submitting traditional handwritten, hand-coded machine learning algorithms, and they're getting to about 75%, 80% accuracy, small incremental gains every year. However, a team from the University of Toronto, led by Alex Krzyzewski, submitted um, a, a neural network into this completely different uh, way of looking at the problem. The neural network outperformed everything that had come before that by a factor of 10%, and they didn't have to do any coding. Um, and we're only just starting to realize why that happened. So in 2012, this paper submitted to the Large Scale Image Recognition Challenge changed everything. And it hasn't stopped there. We've since realized that there's a direct relationship between the size of the data set that you're using and the accuracy of the network. So we consider the ImageNet competition with one and a half million images a fairly small, not trivial, but it's still not a complete data set. With the size of the data set increasing, the accuracy of your network increases. Of course, nobody's looking at these old-fashioned fo old forms of machine learning anymore. Um, and it goes on and on. The larger the network, the more the data, the greater the accuracy. Up until uh, 2016, um, the large-scale image recognition challenge, the neural network computed for that, outperformed the human being. So it's, it's classed as superhuman now. So it will make an error on those recognizing those 1,000 images uh, at a rate uh, lower than a human being. So again, we didn't really understand why this was up until sort of no November 2017 when a team from Baidu um, published a paper uh, uh, charting the relationship between data set size and accuracy across a variety of common um, challenges. So translation, image recognition, um, speech recognition. Um, all of this information is pointing to a direct correlation between accuracy and data set size. And so we're starting to understand a little bit more about how these networks learn. We understand that there's now a relationship between data set size and accuracy. Um, so how does this help us? Well, what we want to be able to do is, let's just say we're going to set a problem for, for a neural network. We're going to build something that's going to be of use to us. So we want to first of all understand um, how much accuracy do we need in this neural network. You know, if we're looking to um, if we're looking to build a network that's going to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, that doesn't necessarily need to be massively effective. If we're looking to build a network um, that will stop a car driving in traffic uh, when the time's right, obviously the accuracy requirements are going to be a little bit higher there. So what we first of all need to do is understand how much accuracy do we need out of our AI algorithm, um, and so we're going to plot a target accuracy there. Um, we're then going to take uh, step two, I think we've moved down forwards a little bit there. We're going to take uh, our existing data set and we're going to plot that against our accuracy. And then from there, bearing in mind these are logarithmic scales either side, um, we should be able to make an informed guess as to whereabouts uh, uh, we need uh, in terms of data in order to get this design accuracy. Again, it's a logarithmic scale. 
And this is important to understand um, the difference between 99.9% .9 and 99.999% um, could be vast. And so um, it's, uh, uh, this typically is the biggest bottleneck in deep learning research today, um, just simple accuracy. Um, but you can't get accuracy because you simply don't have access to a large amount or a sufficient amount of labeled data. There are cheats around uh, that you can, uh, you can apply here. <coughs> okay. So, um, where do we see this actually working in real life? Um, well, if we look at, if, if you go to Google now and you ask Google to translate something for you, you're going to be using the uh, network on the end. It's 100 exaflops. Um, it's a gigantic network. It's tracking the direct correlation between size of network, complexity of network, and accuracy. Um, and in fact, um, uh, Andrew Ng from Stanford, um, who moved across over to Baidu and then back again, um, he was the guy who put the word deep into deep learning by plotting the relationship between the depth of the network and the accuracy. We since uh, uh, have then realized that it's far more about depth, it's more about general overall complexity. Um, so 100 exaflops. Um, on a two year, on a, on, a, on a two socket server, this is gonna take you uh, about two years to run one training iteration. Um, and you may, of course, need to do many training iterations. Um, uh, but this really just describes why this is the technology that's happening now. So, why now? Um, the rise of GPU computing, and of course, we covered the rise of data sets. Data sets are vastly available these days. Um, we, we all have Wi-Fi. We're able to trans transmit data sets um, left and right. Uh, we have access to more data than we've ever known before. Um, what's perhaps less known is the rise of GPU computing. So we instinctively know that computing power has increased over the years. Um, we know that the computers that we've got now are more powerful than the computers we had 10 years ago. What's perhaps less well known is that GPU computing has taken that upwards trend and magnified it by quite a lot. Um, you'll have noticed that the generations of CPU from a couple of years back are fairly similar. They're increasing by about 10% each year for, uh, in exchange for a slight uh, decrease in clock speed. GPU computing, on the other hand, is increasing by about 1.5x at least each year. And so it's access to the amount of parallel computing power that you have now um, really makes this available. So if you see, um, if just behind a LAN there, you'll see a DGX station. So the DGX station there, um, uh, 10 years ago, the largest supercomputer in the world um, was IBM Roadrunner. This needed a building, this needed a power station. You could only photograph IBM Roadrunner with a fisheye lens. And that is about half of IBM Roadrunner. So in, in, in a short space of 10 years, we've decreased the amount of computing power, of single precision computing power, into something that you can put into the boot of your car. Um, and, and it's because of the rise in GPU computing power, the access to data um, that we're now seeing, this technology come from absolutely nowhere in 2012 um, to everywhere in 2018. We see all kinds of statements like this all over the news. Um, uh, China's got a plan, France has a plan, the US are talking about it. We're seeing vast amounts of money. We released our AI sector deal fairly recently. Um, we're talking about how the NHS's data can be used um, to, uh, to train these neural networks, to train these algorithms. Um, uh, you know, this, this is kind of commonplace, really. It's becoming a bit of a meme, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I'd like to just finish up here with um, a, a quote here from Andrew Ng, and this is just sort of tying back into that opening video that we saw about how revolutionary this technology is. Um, as Andrew Ng says, and he's not a man to, um, uh, to talk in hyperbole, uh, just as electricity transformed everything 100 years ago, I have a hard time of thinking of an industry that I don't think AI would transform in the next seven years. Um, in fact, he, he did stand up on stage and say, apart from hairdressing, and somebody stood up uh, from the crowd and said, actually, no, we're building a neural network to help with hairdressing. So um, <laughs> and you can actually go on to NVIDIA's um, uh, website and you can see the, the demo video of exactly what it is that these guys are doing in that field. Right, so with that, um, I'm going to hand back across over to Alan. Um, I think we'll have a Q&A. Um, I'm going to be available throughout the day, so if there's anything that you'd like to talk about, if there's any ideas that you'd like to run past, um, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks, James. Today um, is all about DLI Demystified and it's being hosted by SCAN who are NVIDIA's elite partner. 
Um, they are one of our most prestige partners in the UK for deep learning. It's all about education, it's all about understanding and, and learning how the technology interacts and works with real life cases. And as you know, we, we kind of spent a lot of time building our proof of concepts, so we've helped businesses engage to actually get their hands on this very powerful technology. And that's where events like this really help bring the ecosystem of all our partners and technology together. We've got NVIDIA uh, and uh, you know, GPU technology. Uh, we have uh, H2O, who is um, a, a leader in, uh, in AI analytics. Uh, we have uh, Kinetica, who's a GPU accelerated database, again, focusing on AI and analytics through performance GPU. And we also have Pure Storage uh, and NetApp, who are infrastructure partners for storage. The audience here today has really uh, spanned a spectrum from people that literally are just thinking about what might AI mean for their business, through to people that have been doing some experimentation but haven't yet learned about scale, to a smaller set of customers who are already deploying infrastructure and who have begun to encounter some of those challenges. So a great mix, and it, as I said, that's ideal. You can talk to people early on, but it's also nice to talk to people and validate that they are encountering these issues and you know it's a very receptive audience with whom we can talk about the value of that joint NVIDIA pure storage solution. As AI becomes more ubiquitous, uh, there people kind of have to learn where to use it and when to use it uh, and that's where, where we come into play. You know our expansion is just very dense in regards to the GPU compute so we're very excited for the upcoming, upcoming everything. So these events are really important for, for PMY, for NVIDIA, for Pure Storage, for all the partners that are involved with, with today. Um, the reason being is it's our way of engaging with the end users, the people that are started on their, uh, their, their, their path down the, 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 the road to AI, uh, which is ultimately where, uh, where the future lies for us all. We've just set up a new digital delivery centre in Manchester, a new part of the company. So. This is about sort of starting to get involved with the local tech community, establish some relationships, maybe form some partnerships going forwards, and obviously AI, deep learning is one area that we're looking to get into, so we were kind of invited to this event by one of our directors and sort of come along to find out a bit more, basically. Brand new area of technology, so anything that we can do to sort of learn more from the experts and get involved with that sort of stuff is really interesting to us, I think. Well, the, the way that Broadwood and MSP will use AI, uh, there'll be some inward-facing stuff, so we've got areas where we can actually look at our own data set and see what we can gain from there. But also, if we want to build communities around science and technology, then we can use AI and machine learning as either a service or an expertise where we can bring companies together to work with it together. I think the event's been super. Um, this was our first introductory event to NVIDIA and SCAN and their various platforms and infrastructures. So really pleased with how the morning's gone. Really good attendees and level of engagement. So looking forward to continuing the programme. I think it's gone really well today. Um, yeah, it was a really good turnout. Um, uh, lots of new faces, lots of interesting conversations, lots of new applications for the technology that we hadn't considered and lots of follow-ups as well. Um, I think people take away um, kind of a first introductory experience um, and initial awareness um, of the work that we're planning to do with NVIDIA and SCAN um, and spread that word across the ecosystem in Manchester um, to generate more, more interest in uh, training and learning and development around AI and deep learning. I hope people take away an understanding of how this, um, how this new technology can be of use to their businesses and to how they can start to get value um, for their customers, for their own employees and how to take their businesses to the next level. I think obviously we've got a few contact details and we're going to get in touch about sort of Brewster's concepts and getting in touch with the experts in the industry as I say and start to sort of establish those relationships so that's probably the main thing we'll take away. Yeah. Uh, some feedback uh, that we've had from some customers, some really you know good names like Jaguar Land Rover of how they can get access to the technology quickly um, so they can do their testing, start their proof of concepts. Um, other questions have been around um, you know more education, further education which ties in really nicely with the upcoming DLI workshop that SCAN are hosting in September um, which will be a DLI um, fundamentals of computer vision. The purpose of today was to literally form uh, an understanding and help people engage with where AI is going to go in the future. This was our first uh, Deep Learning Institute event that uh, we wanted to bring to, to Manchester. 
and we had an amazing turnout. Uh, for the first event, we were quite shocked at you know, how many people turned up and the breadth of questions that we were asked and the feedback that we've had afterwards has been brilliant, so we're very, very happy.